For over a month now, I've been preparing the most comprehensive aggregation and curation of all the health data, philosophical principles, economical and societal implications by dozens of the best thinkers and experts to create the most comprehensive resource possible on the closest thing to the truth of COVID-19, how to approach the situation and why it applies to you even if you think it doesn't. So this video will be long and it will be comprehensive and it will cover a wide variety of categories. Before I get into the categories, we, we got to frame the conversation with the mentality that the coronavirus is coming to you if it's not already there. And this is a quote from Thomas Puyol. It's coming to you with an exponential speed, gradually and then suddenly. It's a matter of days, maybe a week or two or a month. When it does, your healthcare system will be overwhelmed like Italy's is, though not all countries will succumb like Italy did. Your fellow citizens will be treated in the hallways, exhausted healthcare workers will break down, some will die, they will have to decide which patient gets oxygen and which one dies. The only way to prevent this is social distancing today, not tomorrow, today. That means keeping as many people home as possible starting now. As a politician, community leader or business leader, you have the power and responsibility to prevent this. You might have fears today, what if I overreact? Will people laugh at me? Will they be angry at me? Will I look stupid? Won't it be better to wait for others to take the steps first? Will I hurt the economy too much? But in two to four weeks, in a month's time, in two months' time, the entire world is in lockdown. When the few, when the few precious days of social distancing you will have enabled will save lives. People won't criticize you anymore. They will thank you for making the right decision. Now, Thomas wrote a article that has been viewed over th uh, about 30 million times now over the last week. Uh, that is a very long read, but uh, what I think is the most comprehensive written review on the coronavirus. And now, all the information I'm about to purport to you, to you uh, it doesn't necessarily all reflect my own thoughts, but it is important to have a. It is important to have an open dialogue and source a wide variety of sources to have an open and honest conversation about the matter, to have the full, the pros and the cons, the argue every single component to have a well-versed, well-rounded argument. It's not about picking sides, it's about finding the closest thing to the truth. And so this document, this resource that is Everything I say will be available in the description below, okay? All to read. I have every single, almost every single word I'm going to say in this in this video will be documented with every resource because it comes from a very wide variety of resources because I've been trying to diversify the information that I've been absorbing as much as possible. And that is number one, okay? Any information that you are absorbing or intaking um, to educate yourself on any topic, we must diversify the information and question the evidence and critically analyze it. And that is what I've been doing for over a month now. And that is something I try to apply as a principle to my life. And there is a lot that we can take away on how to respond to this coronavirus with everything in life. Okay. And so the first place to start is giving you a summary of how this video will go along. We will talk about the immune system. We will talk about the systemic risk of a pandemic. We'll talk about a lot about the mentality and how to approach this mentally because a lot of people are in two camps. And if you're in the camp of like, and you're, you're about to click off the video and you're like, this doesn't apply to me. This isn't real. This is, over, this is overblown. Please, this video is, uh, this is really important for you to hear too. As much as the same person who is fear mongering and scared and fearful and everywhere in the middle. Because usually the middle is probably the place most of us should be. I'm going to talk about why that is. So we're going to cover the history of the coronavirus. We're going to cover the different types of strains, the origin, the incubation period, the reinfection rate. Now, a lot of people don't know that people are getting reinfected now after they've already been cured, if you will. Not cured technically, but after they've already no longer presented symptoms of the virus. We're going to talk about the pressures on the economy and the medical system. Because this doesn't just have implications to health, it has implications to a, the society and community and world at large. Is this just like the flu? What is the difference between this disease and the influenza virus? What is the disease, disease mechanism? A lot of people aren't talking about this, but the actual disease mechanism of how it enters your body, 
what type of cells it affects and what type of respiratory and or other outcomes it has on your body, okay? The viability on surfaces and aerosols, the case fatality ratio, because there is a lot of variability with the case fatality ratios and reproduct, uh, the, uh, the reproduction value or the r naught, the flu sp spreadability, the variety of symptoms, the effect on children, which we know should notice they're actually quite largely protected. Why is that? I'm young and healthy. I'm in my 20s. I'm fit. I'm exercise every day. I have no comorbidities. I will be fine, won't I? We're going to talk about that. The projections that epidemi epidemiologists are looking at. What are the projections for some of this? We're going to talk about my country and my city, Australia, Melbourne. We're going to talk about the implications there. The actual numbers. How accurate are the actual numbers compared to the daily recorded numbers? The testing. The long-term side effects. The effects of an overwhelmed healthcare system in the context, especially of Italy. And in the end, what should you do? I'm going to talk about hygiene, cleaning, the efficacy of masks, washing hands, and everything in between. So, strap yourselves in. I'm going to put timestamps in the bottom. And if there's anything else, any other resources that you want to dig further, question the things that I'm uh, purporting, which aren't exactly from me, they are from, I am just an aggregator. While I am a health professional and have been for the last five years, I'm not speaking from an expert in this field of, viral of virology and epidemiology. I will never, I do not claim to be. I'm claiming to be, I am a health professional, but at the same time, I'm a, I'm a curator and aggregator of information that has been trying to critically analyze all of this information because I think that's what we need right now in a world that is overwhelmed with a wide variety of information, headline reading, and, and media that tries to suck you in down their rabbit hole. Okay. Let's begin. Let's first start off with the mentality. People have arguments such as the risk of dying from coronavirus-19 is smaller than the risk of X or Y. Say getting hit by a car, okay? Say, you say, oh, the risk of getting hit by a car is more than the, uh, dying from the coronavirus. And let's assume you're right and that is correct. Even then, that doesn't diminish the downstream consequences of the decision to ignore or not proactively act. Why? Because one is systemic, relating to a whole system, and one is idiosyn idiosyncratic, which relates to a finite, limited number of assets. If I don't act against my own probabilistic interests, I will be helping COVID spread, and other people will get sick, die, and that will put further pressure on, on the economy and the medical system. And that is by Nassim Talib, an amazing thinker, mathematician, uh, expert on probability. You'd always rather be blamed for overreacting and underreacting in situations like this. Because the consequences for underreacting are far greater and far more dire than the consequences for overreacting. So... Really important, if I don't act against my probabilistic interest, I will be helping coronavirus spread. That is the camp you're in if you decide to do nothing. And we're going to talk about further on how actually that will happen, how the spreadability is why it's high and how that is actually happening. So the trouble about comparing coronavirus to other things, like we just did, car accidents, past viruses, is that in statistics, it is said that you do not compare data that does not have the same variance, aka something that is exponentially growing, like the coronavirus is, like a dynamic issue like this is, cannot be compared to something that is static, like we are doing with previous statistics and previous viruses. While we may be able to get some context and some general rough estimations around uh, and projections around a certain outcome, in statistics, it is said that this is not effective to compare these two. We have one that are variables that are static and ones that are dynamic. So there is a flaw there. Now, some important questions to ask that we all must ask immediately. Number one, and Peter Otea helped provoke these thoughts. Dr. Peter Otea, an amazing doctor I recommend to all of you. Well, number one, are you in an area where there is a community outbreak? Well, with over 120 plus countries now, as of March 15th, when this is being recorded, you need to ask yourself, are you in an area where there is a community outbreak? What does area mean? It depends how you define it. Your area could be your county, your suburb, or your city. I classify my area as my city of Melbourne. 
Number two, are you an individual who is at risk or lives in close proximity to someone at risk? High risk, classified as 55 to 60 plus, and or has comorbidities. Comorbidities, for those who don't understand, example would be diabetes, obesity, age, smoking, history of cardiovascular or respiratory uh, disease, or high blood pressure. These are examples of comorbidities. Comorbidities, these illnesses then increase your risk of dying from another illness. In this context, the virus. So, if you can answer no to both questions, you are in a better situation to most. But the personal decision remains to avoid your large group social distancing and maintain meticulous hygiene, to avoid spreading to others in your community, which can have significant downstream consequences to the optimal level depending on what mentality is taken. Pardon me. Which can have significant consequences at the optional level depending on what mentality is taken. So, but if you answered yes, you have to make the cost-benefit analysis. Either social isolation needs to be seriously considered and implemented or you play the odds and potentially put many others at risk. Everybody has, and I said this from the start to people close to me, everybody has a different risk analysis of how they assess risk. But it is a point now, and that what many people earlier on, months ago, were saying, that erring on the side of caution is usually always better because the potential risk far outweighs uh, the cost of isolating yourself or doing the action that is going to be proactive. And if you're going to make mistakes, which we all will, you're better making mistakes on the side of precaution than on making mistakes on the side of lack of precaution. The consequences are much more dire and severe on lack of precaution. And we see the latter often with how people live their unhealthy lives. They wait until something bad happens to them. They think they're living a healthy lifestyle or they're doing things that aren't going to help them and are going to harm them in the future. So we're trying to frame the conversation here and this is just be, this is well beyond how you respond to a coronavirus. This is how you respond to life, okay? Precaution, it's like proactivity or reactivity. Are we going to wait for the injury to happen in a person or are we going to do things to mitigate it? Oh, there, that's why we exercise, to mitigate disease, to mitigate injury. There is almost no advantage to being a late mover. So why wait? Because right now we're living, and previously this is especially more evident that people are divided between pro-panic and pro-nonchalance. One group's panic seems to be driving another's nonchalance and vice versa. The pro-panic faction, while perhaps not entirely justified, is far less of a public health risk than the pro-nonchalance faction. The later you panic, the less effective you will be and the more you put others at risk. And people have this stigma around panic. And we're going to talk about the implications of stress and cortisol on the immune system. Panic. If that means you do something like basic emergency stocking up that we all should have anyway, is that really panicking? There are so many reasons we all should all have 14 days of, of food, water, supplies, have the ability to have electricity and gas and supply ourselves if anything happens, um, like services go down. That in of itself has nothing to do with the coronavirus, but, but things like this teach us the effectiveness and the lesson of planning because anything can happen. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. This could be a terrorist attack. This could be a biological threat, man-made or not. Suffering, catastrophe and pain and unfortunate circumstances are coming. You're probably better off. No, no, not probably. You are better off to prepare for those. So the folks accused of panicking, are the people taking it too seriously? Is actually still the nonchalant who will panic eventually because they are totally unprepared. It's the classic ant and grasshopper dynamics. That is from Navar Ravikon. Is panic really worse than neglect and carelessness during an epidemic of this sort? Those who panicked early don't have to panic today. Nassim Talib. And what we're seeing is a lot of people are suffering from something called normalcy bias. And I have, earlier on, you saw this. It's a tendency for people to believe that things will always function the way they normally have functioned and therefore underestimate both the likelihood of a disaster and its possible effects. People go about their lives living under, this, under the normalcy bias 
when their loved ones are parents, family members who are doing potentially things that could harm their health. They don't consider the consequences of them and that they could be ill and die from them at any moment. Normalcy bias is expressed itself also just with everybody, all your friends and all your family, everybody you know will eventually die. And we have this tendency to assume and subconsciously assume that everything will remain the same and it will be fine. While we still know at the back of our mind that we see suffering catastrophe all around us, but no, it can't happen to us. And so normalcy bias is especially relevant here, especially earlier on in the January, February months of 2020, when people downplayed the potential ramifications of this virus, even though we saw very clearly the implications in China and the consequences there. Not taking risks one doesn't understand is often the best form of risk management. Another analogy I like to frame the conversation with is that we put on our seatbelt to protect us for when an accident happens. We don't expect to get in an accident today, but we protect ourselves and prepare anyway for the eventual couple times in our life that it will, it will eventually occur. So the, what's the seatbelt? The seatbelt is the preparation. The seatbelt is, well, it was and still is for some people, four weeks worth of food, water, cleaning equipment that you can clean your environment with for you and your family. I live in a country where we have a lot of bushfires or also known as wildfires. Most people weren't prepared for the devastating wildfires that we had in our country just in late 2019, early 2020. They weren't prepared. They didn't have masks because then we had terrible, terrible air quality that, was, that peaked into the, into the worst in the world often. And there are going to be a lot of downs, there are a lot of consequences of this on respiratory function and all cause mortality. We weren't prepared. Even city folk, people who live far, who live far away, were prepared when their city was covered in, in, in smog and the air was now polluted. Put your seatbelt on and prepare and diversify your sources of information, like I said earlier. And be suspicious of stories because there's panic. There's the panic everyone's not going to be okay story and then there's the everything is going to be fine story. And the, probably the truth is somewhere in the middle and that is what I'm trying to pass out today. Fatalism and inaction. Perhaps due to these challenges, a common public health response is fatalistic, accepting that what will happen because of a belief that nothing can be done. This fatalistic, nihilistic idea that, well, it's all, it's all gone to shit now. Nothing can be done. You see people... There are people out there, there's, there's videos and content out there of people in China and in America and all around the world, minority though, that are, who are sick and who are purposefully sharing their sickness with other people, coughing on things, purposely sharing their poor bacteria, coughing on things, t like t touching saliva, putting it on something. It's like, well, if everyone's going down, you're all going, if I'm going down, you're all going down with me. And this response is incorrect as the leverage of correctly selected extraordinary interventions can be very high. The leverage of correctly selected extraordinary interventions can be very high. And that expresses itself in the, in the face of social isolation, hygiene, getting things delivered to you, understanding that UV light can be effective for mitigating or shortening the lifespan of a virus on a surface. We must remember we are only here because our grandparents and ancestors prepared ahead of times of stress and hardship. They put away food and planned against potential misfortune. Why don't you think you should do the same? Why do you think you are immune to this? This is a summary by Nassim Talib. Multi-scale population approaches, including drastically pruning contact networks, using collective boundaries and social behavior change, and community self-monitoring are essential. Together, these observations lead to the necessity of precautionary approach to current and potential pandemic outbreaks that must include constraining mobility patterns in early stages of an outbreak, especially when little is known about the true parameters of the pathogen. You see, there were experts out there warning against this that we must constrain our mobility patterns in the early stages of an outbreak, especially when little is known, because when little is known, we are ignorant and we can get caught off guard very easily. And that is what is happening all around the world right now. You see, regardless of whatever happens with 
COVID. It is not about so much what is happening now. It is about the future of what worse things can happen and will happen. This is the lesson. And some argue that we should have learned 10 years ago with SARS, or rather 20 years ago with SARS, and 10 years ago with MERS. Well, here's another wake-up call. So, it will cost something to reduce mobility in the short term, but to, to fail to do so will eventually cost everything. If not from this event, then one in the future. Outbreaks are inevitable, but an appropriately precautionary response can mitigate systemic risk to the global, the globe at large. But policy and decision makers must act swiftly and avoid the fallacy that to have an appropriate respect for uncertainty, uncertainty in the face of possible irreversible catastrophe amounts to paranoia. So he's saying that we must avoid the fallacy that to associate paranoia with proactive early decision making or the converse belief that nothing can be done. So, and uh, I'm going to quote a really important analogy that Tim Ferriss made that like we all have a fire extinguisher in our home, right? We all have a fire extinguisher. Would you accept $100 to get rid of it? What about 1000 Probably not. I wouldn't. As unlikely as a kitchen fire might be, as unlikely as you dying from the coronavirus or you being inf infected by it, depending on your area, the extreme known consequences of an out-of-control fire are easily justifiable to have a fire extinguisher. So what's the correlation to that? What's, what's the analogy to that? What's that analogous to? Well, the fire, the, the fire could represent a big community outbreak, like Italy's saying. They didn't pull out that fire extinguisher early enough. The fire extinguisher could be like in Wuhan. They're wet markets causing, contributing to viral outbreaks that this is not the first time it's happened to. And we're going to talk about the origins a bit later. The fire for you could be you and your family getting sick. And maybe one of them has some comorbidities and over 60 and one of them gets seriously ill. And for one of you listening, you're going to know someone who's going to die. At least one of you will. Even though some folks thinks, think uh, of me, think of me, or let's say people think of you as a risk taker. It's about a, being a risk mitigator. You're putting on your seatbelt. It's easy to mitigate a lot of the downside risk until the data paints a clear picture. And sometimes when you wait for the data to paint a clear picture, it's too late. Panic rarely creates a proper response to anything, some say. If you are healthy, have a solid immune system, not within the age risk, and use basic precautions, you're probably going to be fine. You're probably going to be fine. Like we know 80% of the cases experience mild to moderate symptoms. But that doesn't take into consideration older populations who are at higher risk. Some of our colleagues who are infected also have infected relatives, and some of their relatives are already struggling between life and death. So be patient. You can't go to the theater or the museums or the gym. Try to have pity on the myriad of old people you could exterminate. We all know and have, we all know people who are 60 plus with comorbidities in our life. We all, if we don't have a grandparent, we know someone who does close to us. It's a, it, it, while it may not be able to relate to you directly, it can and likely will via proxy of someone you know. And then, and only then, will you likely really care. But maybe this can provide some framework on why you should now. And before we really get into the weeds here, I want to provoke a thought that this perhaps is a dry run for when a synthetic biological weapon is synthesized and used against a population. If you don't think a terrorist organization, an individual or a group of individuals with or without political motives can synthesize a biological weapon and use it against you within the next hundred years, I think you're living under that normalcy bias. You need to consider that situations like catastrophes like these are dry runs for worse situations. Things can always get worse and things can always get better, but the potential for both remains. 
Now let's get into the nitty gritty of now talking about the virus. Now that we framed the conversation, a really important framework of the mentality of how we should how we should think about this. So, what about the systemic risk of a pandemic? What a virus? There's something called the red coin hypothesis, and it's the idea that bacteria and viruses are the natural predators of humanity. We are locked in a red queen arms race, accelerated by increasing population, urbanization, and travel. Nasim Talib. So the Red Queen hy- hypothesis is an evolutionary hypothesis which purports that organisms must constantly adapt, evolve, and proliferate in order to survive while pitted against ever-evolving opposing organisms in a constantly changing environment, as well as to gain reproductive advantage, which ties into the uh, actual selection. While there is a... And this is... While there is a very high probability for humanity surviving a single such event, over time, there is eventually zero probability of surviving repeated exposures to such events. That is by Nassim Talib, and I don't, he's an expert on probability. I am not. So I don't know, I can't question the veracity of that statement, okay? But let's assume he's correct, or even close to correct, which makes sense, that there, eventually there is going to be something that wipes out a species entirely. We've seen it time and time again with a a variety of different species. In fact, we've done onto other species. And so by that truth, if we are to believe that, which I think we are inclined to based on probability, history, etc., then we should take every situation like this, like the coronavirus, seriously. Because eventually eventually there is going to be a zero probability of surviving. So you might as well do everything you can to mitigate that. Because maybe there's a flaw in that and maybe we can mitigate it. So, viruses. Bacteria and viruses. Bacteria is a biological cell microorganism, you can see with the microscope. Viruses are a biological agent that need a host to replicate, mutate, and spread. They need a host. For example, a coronavirus were originally discovered in 1966, if I recall correctly, in bats. They need a host to replicate, mutate, and spread. And we're going to talk about the origins. I won't get ahead of myself, but I just wanted to make distinguish the, the distinguishing quick fact uh, distinguish between viruses and bacteria. There are three stages to transmit a virus: contact with a susceptible host, infection, and replication. Number two, and number three is transmission. To other individuals. All right. Now, SARS CoV 2 coronavirus 19. What is the virus nomenclature? The coronavirus is the official designated name of the disease by the World Health Organization because people get confused. Okay. Coronavirus 19 is a disease. The causative agent. Virus is SARS coronavirus 2. Just like there's AIDS, which is the disease, there's HIV, which is the virus. There's the name of the disease and there's the virus. That's what we're distinguishing between the two. So what is the history of of coronavirus? Coronavirus is not new, as many people think it is. It's a strain that's mutated from what's already been around and and first discovered in bats, like I said, in 66. They are RNA viruses, which is why they replicate so quickly compared to a DNA virus. And they predominantly affect the respiratory system. And we've already actually had three major pandemics caused by coronaviruses in the 21st century. So most people forget this or don't consider this, that the last three major pandemics were at the result of coronaviruses. SARS, coronavirus 1, 2003. 2012, MERS which is the Middle Eastern one, coronavirus. And now, 2019, SARS coronavirus 2. So you can almost project into the future that in around 10 years' time, we're gonna, this is going to happen again. And then again, might as well prepare for it because unfortunately, I did not. I was too young to see these patterns. I wasn't smart enough as a teenager to see these patterns. And a lot of people, even older, Did not too. So we've had a new coronavirus each decade of the 21st century. And while SARS-CoV-2 is not as deadly as SARS-1 or MERS, nor is it the most transmissible, 
It is high in both categories and that combines in a very unique way where you have a large cohort of the population shedding the virus while only certain groups getting seriously affected. And there's Peter Hotez, a PhD expert on viral diseases. And there are a lot of great diagrams and graphs that are contained in the link, the Evernote link in this description to everything I'm saying in this video. If you want some visualization as we're going along, then you're welcome to look on your phone or computer as we go. So they've identified two strains of this coronavirus. Uh, I believe the Chinese identify it. There's a link for everything I'm saying in the notes. The L-type, which is more aggressive and prevalent during the early stages of the outbreak in Wuhan, and then which originated in the epicenter of the virus and accounted for about 70% of the analyzed strains. And there's 30% of the strains that were linked to the S-type, which is considered less aggressive. So we right now, we, we don't know who's getting what, which leaves this situation to be particularly dynamic and unpredictable. Okay, now let's talk about the origin because this is critically important. Why do diseases keep appearing in China? And what are the implications to what we can actually do about it? Well, why do diseases keep appearing in China? Wet markets. Wet markets is where live wild animals are killed and sold. The Chinese government allowed wet markets in the 1970s due to famine killing tens of millions of people. People just weren't getting fed. So they turned to the people to start farming and distributing food. In 1988, government made a law which designated wildlife animals as a resource owned by the state and protected people engaged in the utilization of wildlife resources, aka killing and selling wild animals. This is quite uncommon to most other countries in the world, especially non-Eastern countries. It has also encouraged the domestication and breeding of wildlife. We're not talking about pigs and sheep here, we're talking about wild animals, we're talking about bears, we're talking about bats, pangolins, um, every wild animal that you can see in a zoo, we're talking about most of them. I like to factory farming, so this is, we're talking about like, fa everyone knows factory farming, well, we're talking about like factory farming for wild animals. That is what a lot of the Chinese have been doing in these wet markets. Thus, an industry was born, and then this provided cover for an endangered wildlife farming of things like tigers, rhinos, pangolins, as I said. And when they found out SARS was linked to civet cats being sold at wet markets, they banned wet markets. But guess what? After the outbreak was, was over, they lifted the ban. So they, we, knew, we knew, we knew that SARS came from civet cats being sold at wet markets. Then they did something about it because they were reactive and then they lifted the ban. Why did they lift the ban? Well, your, our democracy or your democracy is not the same as someone else's communist-run totalitarian-like government. They can make quick decisions that the people necessarily don't necessarily all agree with. It's another topic though. So in 2018, the, this wildlife farming industry was worth $150 billion, an extended influence over the Chinese government and lobbying. So why was it lifted, the ban? Well, that's why. It made a lot of money and it had lobbying capabilities. The demand was driven by wealthy minority who think these wild animals have medicinal benefits. And we know that the evidence on, on them having medicinal, like, uh, for example, a uh, bear gallbladder is very sought after, which is such a shame. It's, it's such a terrible misnomer that has affected a wide variety of, of wildlife, including bears. And so there's this minority of wealthy and rich who keep these wet markets going because they will pay a lot. And so that is the root cause of the coronavirus 19. Because guess what? It came from bats that then were transmitted to pangolins, which are then transmitted to humans. That is what we, th we suspect. And guess what the Chinese government did? They shut down the, the wet markets again. So unless there is a pertinent ban, then outbreaks like this will are bound to happen again and again and again. And so, at least now you know. At least now you know to be aware that wet markets are something that is propagating the spread of 
mutated diseases because when they go from host to host, the virus will continue to mutate. And that there is pressure that we can put on our governments and our community at large to create a better society. There's a quote by Mahatma Gandhi, especially poignant in this situation. The greatness of a nation and its moral progression can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And perhaps we will be treated and judged very harshly in the future by the way we have treated ours. Now the origin is out the way and I encourage you to watch a very good video on Vox that summarizes exactly what I just said if you want to know more. Now let's talk about the incubation period. How long can you have the virus for and not present symptoms? How long can it be incubating in you before you present symptoms? And so we know people can be asymptomatic, which means you have a certain condition and don't present symptoms for up to two weeks, 24 days and could be spreading the virus. That is some of the earlier data that came out. But the most recent data that may be more accurate is that the median incubation period was estimated to be 5.1 days. The median is directly in the, is the middle data point. Okay, so there's people above and below, but that is the middle data point, not the average, the middle. And we also saw that the confidence interval was between 4.5 to 5.8 days. So there's a range. And confidence interval, interval, for those who remember statistics or don't remember statistics, uh, demonstrates that researchers are 95% confident that the results fall between this range. However, 97.5% of those developing symptoms will do so within... 11.5 days, confidence interval 8.2 to 15.6 days. So you're giving that two, that's where that two week number came from, of that they can be asymptomatic for up to two weeks. But these estimates imply, under conservative assumptions, that 101 out of every 10,000 cases will develop symptoms after 14 days of active monitoring or quarantine. Now, while this, the implications of that out of 100 people is quite small, but the implications of these small minority percentages in a wider population of hundreds of thousands and millions can have significant ramifications. And that is why they must be talked about. And there is a case of a woman who traveled from Wuhan to another part of China where she tested positive after her 15-day quarantine. Okay, and so this provides a limitation to two-week quarantines and the question of how effective they really are. And if you want to err on the side of caution, that, that perhaps 24 days is the safest suggestion to adhere to. A study suggested while mild people, mild infections can still test positive for throat swabs for days and even weeks after their illness, those who are only mildly sick are likely not still infectious by about 10 days after they experience symptoms. Studies show asymptomatic carriers spread the virus. Everyone should wear masks and distance wash their hands. It's the herd immunity argument, not just for individuals, prioritize medical staff, surgical masks are paper and plastic, make more, billions of Asians aren't wrong. That's by Naval Ravikant. Okay, and we'll talk about the eff efficacy of masks later on. About a, around a fifth of people who are hospita hospitalized require ICU. An important statistic to consider right now before we get into talking about the pressures of the medical system and the limitations that, we, that uh, hospitals have for ICU and respiratory aid. So something that is particularly poignant is the idea of reinfection. No one has really talked about that, the fact that people can actually get reinfected because it hasn't really happened that often, but, and you need a more longitudinal time period to pass out the data and actually see it happening. You, you need months and even years to really see the efficacy of reinfection, okay? But we're starting to see cases of it now, which is quite alarming because there have been a number of cases of reinfection in China, number one, about 14% of patients who recovered from the novel coronavirus were discharged from hospitals in southern Guangdong province in China, and they were tested positive again in later checkups. A positive test suggests that recovered patients may still carry the virus, adding complexity to efforts to control the outbreak. Now, whether they are still, the, the, how much viral load they have, which is how basically <laughs> their ability to spread the virus, Viral load is, is, is a measurement of your ability to, to spread the virus. And so, or as a proxy for that. 
how uh, spread how, how much they can spread the virus in that situation is remains to be seen. We don't know. Okay, but in March 15, which is today, Japan confirms its first case of a person reinfected with the coronavirus. Cases of reinfection have health experts worried that illness could remain dormant after an apparent recovery, and as it should, because we just don't have a lot of the information about this virus. And so hearing this should send caution to people. And once you have the infection, they say it could remain dormant with minimal sem- symptoms. And then you get an ex- exacerbation stimulated by a lowered immune system, perhaps, that's my theory, and it finds your way into your lungs to then stimulate a reinfection. So we're saying that people who have recovered or supposedly recovered may get reinfected if the virus stays dormant in them with minimal symptoms, possibly due to a lowered immune system via stress, too much vigorous activity. There's a plethora of ways you can lower your immune system. And so that is a very important consideration and something we may see pass out more in the future. As a really good infograph uh, by informationisbeautiful.com, which do some amazing infographs that that purport and have demonstrated that around 20%, well, actually, let, let me start from the top. The majority of infections are mild. And perhaps we should have started with this a bit earlier, but the majority of infections are mild. 80.9% of cases stay at home. Oh, sorry. No, it's not accurate. 80.9% of cases experience mild to moderate symptoms, flu-like symptoms, and they are likely to stay home depending on the region you're in and the rules they have with testing. 13.8% require severe hospitalization and 4.7% require critical intensive care. And this was a study done on nearly 45,000 confirmed cases in mainland China. This is from the China Center for Disease and Control. So we're getting data from the Chinese and which can have implications, strong implications to the rest of the world. But we're seeing in countries like Italy and Iran that the data around that is different because it changes when you put pressure on a medical system and overwhelm it. And a really important consideration to make when for the people who think, well, I'm low risk, I don't need to do anything, this is too much, this is all crap, whatever. The the, the problem is that even even if you get it and you present very mild symptoms and you're fine and you infect somebody else and they need to be hospitalized or maybe the person they infect then needs ICU, which is originally from you, the problem is that Things like ventilators and ECMO units can't be produced or bought easily. A few years ago, the US had 250 ESMO machines, which are like machines that help with breathing and respiration, um, I believe. So if you suddenly have 10,000 people infected, many of them will want to go ahead and get tested. Around 20,000 will require hospitalization. 5,000 will need ICU. And around 1,000 would need machines that we just don't have enough of today. And that's just with 100,000 cases. And how we're getting those specific numbers, we're extrapolating the percentages and just dividing it. Okay? And so this, is, this, this can be very serious depending on the distribution and how quickly it spreads. We have a very, what's called a fat tail distribution right now. There is a big spike and it's very thick. What we need to do is flatten the curve, which you may have heard or seen in graphs before. We need to distribute the spread. It, even if epidemiologists are correct saying that, or even if they're close to correct saying that, you know what, millions of people will get this, or hundreds of thousands of people will get this around the world. All right. Well, actually, already hundreds of thousands pretty much almost have with nearly 200,000 cases. So let's say they're right, and millions of people will eventually be affected by the end of the year, and it's something we all need to develop herd immunity with. Okay. Well, we need to do everything we can to stretch that. We need to flatten that curve because the economic and medical hospitalization implications are severe. And we'll talk about the details of it later on, but it could be the difference between them having to pick who dies and who lives. And we're seeing that in Italy. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to provide some of the evidence for that very soon. Now, there are a lot of people who are saying, it's just like the flu. I heard this quite a few times and I really tried to pass this out because I guess what? We want it to just be like the flu. 
We don't want to be right. People who are saying it's just like the flu want to be right because they want to diminish, fulfill normalcy bias, diminish the potential effects of something like this. That is good. We want to diminish the potential effects. We don't want this to be as serious as it is. But the risks of underestimating and underreacting are far more severe than overreacting. So what's the difference between this disease and the influenza? Let's, let's not even, okay, let's not even get, emo, let's make no, no emotion about this. I'm clearly passionate about this because if you fall on the side of that, it's just like the flu, you're falling on the side of, of non-factual information. You're, just, you're, you're fa factually incorrect currently. And guess what? I want to be wrong. I don't want to be right. I've been saying that for weeks and months to people around me. I don't want to be right. Because if I'm right, and if we're right, that's not good. That's bad. I haven't been affected. Nobody I know personally has been personally affected. It's a non-emotional thing for me. But I care about the other motherfuckers out there. My grandmother, your grandmother, your grandparents, your parents. So is it just like the flu? Coronavirus is not the flu. It is a, and you're gonna hear different ranges on this one. It is approximately 10 times more lethal, lethal if we are to average the total population assuming lethality is around 1%. Okay, now you'll hear different ranges. Some countries we see 40 to 60 times, 40 to 60 times deadlier, like in Italy. But there are other co uh, confounding uh, variables and factors such as comorbidities and older population and medical system being overwhelmed. So you'll hear things like 35 times hospitalization rate of people who are 80 plus years old. But most commonly, kind of the most strongest uh, statistics that we see is that the 80 plus year, years old have a 14.8% fatality rate. The 70 to 79 years old, 8% fatality rate. The 60 to 69 years old, a 3.6% fatality rate. And 15 to 20% of all cases require hospitalization. I don't know how accurate that last one is, uh, but we will keep going and I'm just going to deliver you guys just the, the the breadth of the information, okay? We know influenza is a very known deadly pathogen. It does very predictable things that cripples the immune system, creating a hyperactive immune response, which is why you get knocked out by the flu. You get the fever, the chills, etc. You know, it's predictable in a lot of ways. Coronavirus is not predictable disease, and here's why. So we're going to talk about the disease mechanism. So something that very few people are talking about, and I credit uh, Peter Atia for, for leading the charge on this, who, who I got this from. So coronavirus attacks a particular type of cell via the ACE2 receptor. So the ACE2 receptor acts as a portal to which the virus gains access to a cell called a type 2 pneumocyte, or type 2 alveoli cells contained in the respiratory system. The cell, the cell responsible for the production and secretion of, so the type 2 pneumocytes that the virus accesses, accesses, this cell is responsible for the production and secretion of pulmonary surfactant. If you remember from physiology, if you ever did it, pulmonary surfactant is a detergent-like substance molecule that reduces the surface tension of pulmonary fluids that contribute to the elastic properties of lungs, okay? So the lungs are elastic in a way that they must recoil and, and distend. They have this fluctuating elastic nature, almost like a tendon that, recoil, that absorbs, recoils, and comes back, goes back and forth. So it's important for inflating the alveoli sacs to overcome the surface tension that would otherwise prevent them from opening. This is important for what we call compliance. So compliance, when we talk about the respiratory system and the lungs, is the effort required to distend and swell the lungs. And elastanes equals the lungs, lungs tendency to recoil after distension. Distension, think about expansion, okay? So it's pulmonary surfactant is really, really important, okay? So what is happening is that this virus is attacking these type 2 pneumocytes via the ACE2 receptor and it binds with very high affinity. And we've known about that the, the SARS coronavirus has a very high affinity for the ACE2 receptor in a paper in 2005 that was put out. 
So when you attack these type 2 pneumocytes, then you're unable to make surfactant, which is what leads to this respiratory demise. So it's like why people get respiratory issues? Well, this is why, because pulmonary surfactant is getting so affected and diminished. And it's causing this rapid respiratory decline in function that makes this virus so different. So you can be healthy, have no comorbidities, and still succumb to this. However, it does bias older populations with comorbidities. We see actually, to go out slightly off topic, but on topic, is that we actually see uh, a lot of newborns, they will have respiratory distress syndrome um, because they lack pulmonary surfactant. So it mostly occurs in premature infants because their lungs are not mature enough to produce pulmonary surfactant. They have very weak muscles. They can't expand their lungs. And you get a lot of premature deaths in babies from this, rep this RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, because of pulmonary surfactant. So it's almost having a similar alike effect to it in adults, in people who are grown. Moreover, there also seems to be some myocardial, myocardial meaning myo, muscle, cardial, referencing the heart, it seems to be myocardial damage seen because the ACE2 receptors, um, because the ACE2 receptors uh, the virus is targeting um, aren't just contained in the lungs. They're found in other tissues like the heart, meaning they be there may be other implications to longer-term tissue damage, and we need to consider this. Um, but it's very hard, again, to pass out long-term implications because the data distribution is so small because we're only talking about three months almost worth of data, which is really relatively small in comparison to years and years of confidence in more, what most research uh, articles on virology are done on. And so there's a really uh, nice looking graph that I put on uh, the link below on the flu versus the coronavirus death rate by age. And this really well predicts that, you know, while the flu has a 0.1% death rate or case fatality ratio, approximately, and it's biases towards older population 65 and over again, that what the coronavirus biases is still once again this older population, 50 plus, but we see a 1 plus percent case fatality ratio from people in their 50s and below and 50s and above. And we see this dramatic uptick from 70 to 80 plus from 8% all the way to 20%. So this is why the case fatality uh, uh, death ratio is, is so much higher. Um, but no one is immune to it. You can succumb to it. There are people in their 20s and 30s who are succumbing to this. And so we're going to talk about the case fatality ratio right now, which is the ratio of deaths to the number of cases. So for, as I said, the seasonal flu, it's 0.1%. Uh, coronavirus, it has a range, once again, as most things do in statistics, between 0.6 and 3.4 slash 4%. So let's call it 0.6 to 4%. So it is 4 to 20 times higher than influenza, depending on the region. Older population, 60 plus, the mortality is 10 to 20%. But globally right now, the case fatality ratio is 3.5%, approximately. The case fatality ratio in countries and regions outside of mainland China is approximately 2.1%. Okay, so two for every 100 people, 3.5 for, for every 100 people approximately. Okay, the case fatality ratio, we must explain the case fatality ratio divides is typically an overestimate of the aggregate total mortality because it can't count the number of people who have the disease and who aren't getting tested. Because there are there are criteria restrictions, there are testing kit limitations, there are all these limitations. So basically, for example, I may have it now, or I know people, actually do know people right now who are experiencing cold and flu symptoms. But our Australian government right now, there is a criteria where if you're experiencing these mild, moderate symptoms and or you haven't been in contact with people who have traveled from um, another country, then you actually can't get tested right now. Okay, and I think that's a severe limitation in the system because the more data we have and the more we know, and the more accurate we can be to make better quality decisions. So I think that's a limitation there and we, I could go on it, but I won't. But let it be known that actually, and this is a good thing, that the case fatality ratio is, will often ends up being lower in the end once we aggregate the total data and figure out how many people were actually all affected. So great, that's good news. What's bad news is the spreadability of this. 
And the spreadability of it is very rapid. And we can see that every day it's going up by about 8 to 15%, 5 to 15% every day compared to the last day. You got 100,000, let's say, let's say you get uh, 100 new cases yesterday. Well, now it's going to be 105 to 115. And it keeps compounding on itself. There is a doubling rate as well. And we'll talk about more of the details around that. Okay. But the case fatality ratio, so that's a positive, right? That it is usually lower than it appears. That's why there's a range and it's why it's region specific. So in February 24, the Chinese CDC found the, the case fatality ratio, as I said, to be 2.3% um, in patients. And then we're going to aggregate based on age. In patients aged 80 plus, it was around 15%. Okay, pre-existing comorbidities uh, elevated significantly. So cardiovascular disease elevated it by 10.5%. Um, diabetes, 7.3% increase. Chronic respiratory disease, 6.3% increase. Hypertension, 6% increase. Cancer, 5.6% increase. We all know somebody who has one of those comorbidities or a number of them. We all know somebody who is older, of older age. And age is a comorbidity or it's considered at least a increase in odds. It can increase your odds for death and illness. And most people, we know most people who need medical attention will survive, but they typically need respiratory support until they recover. And this includes people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. This is the insidious component of this virus and the effect it can have on those type 2 alveolar cells to break down respiratory function, decrease pulmonary surfactant, which has had significant consequences on the healthcare system because now we need all this respiratory aid that we don't have depending on how many people come into that hospital. Now, a really important point to make is that the, 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 while the World Health Organization quotes the fatality rate as 3.5%, the number is out of context. And this is from the article I talked about earlier that had nearly 30, 30 million uh, views, probably the best written article I've seen on this whole thing. So, because we want to talk about both sides. We want to make sure we understand the breadth of all the information. There's two ways you can calculate the fatality rate. There is deaths over total cases, which includes active open cases. And there is deaths over closed cases. Thus, that doesn't include the active cases that haven't been resolved. The first one is likely to underestimate because lots of open cases can still end up in death. The second usually overestimates because it's likely that deaths are closed quicker than recoveries. So... What I did look at was how both evolve over time. Both these numbers will converge to the same result once all the cases are closed. So if you project past trends to the future, you can make a guess on what the final fatality rate will be. Hubie's fat, uh, uh, fatality rate will probably converge somewhere between 4.8%. Meanwhile, the rest of China on around 0.9%. Iran and Italy's deaths slash total cases are both converging towards the 3 to 4% range. My guess is their numbers will end around that figure as well. South Korea is the most intriguing example because these two numbers are completely disconnected. Deaths over total cases is only 0.6%, but deaths over closed cases is as high as 48%. So there are some unique things happening in South Korea. First, they're, they're testing everybody. And with so many open cases, the death rate seems low, leaving the open cases open for longer. Um... And so the closed cases don't get, uh, so they close cases quickly when patients die. If you want to know more details about how recording and fatality rates, then go check out that article. It's, it's really good and how the numbers are actually out of context and how they will converge on a lower number uh, usually, which is positive, but we need to consider that there is two different factors to this and that is deaths over total cases and deaths over closed cases, okay? But they all converge on the same one. The, the point is that you conclude, this is what you conclude, excluding these countries that are prepared will see a fatality rate of 0.5 approximately percent, like South Korea, 2.9%, like the rest of China. Countries that are overwhelmed will have a fatality rate of 3 to 5%. Now that is significant, okay? Even though if we look at point, even if we look, we go best case scenario, 1% fatality rate, which is 10, still 10 times more fatal than the flu, okay? Which can have, let's say the flu kills 50,000 people a year, which it approximately does, as the ranges are different in America or wherever you're picking. Well, 50,000 50, times 10 is a, is a fat number. 
is a big number. And then if you if you extrapolate that out to three to five percent, so now you're going 20, 30, 40, 50 times X, can your medical system and economy stand that? Because it all depends how quickly that happens. Okay. Now we've talked about the case fatality ratio. We're going to talk about the basic reproductive value, the flu spreadability, also known as the R naught. If you're reading it as R zero, it is incorrect. It is pronounced R naught. The spread of, and this is particularly why this particular virus is quite insidious. The seasonal flu has an R naught of one point to one point two eight, meaning it is the average number of people who would catch a disease from a single infected per infected person who has never seen the disease before. So, for every person who catches the seasonal flu, you will get one to one point two eight people who will get that disease, uh, get that flu. The coronavirus is quite dynamic. And we don't have the exact number because it is constantly fluctuating, but it is somewhere between two to five. So for every person who gets it, two to five people can be infected. While the difference between the number one to the number five is only four, and it seems like the number four is a very small number, well, we need to think relative to the context of probability, spreadability, two to five is actually a lot higher and has significant implications when you look at a population. The better our interventions get, the lower that number gets, and we want to lower that, that, that number. The overall probability of a transmission's events to happen before the infector becomes symptomatic is 26%. Now, why that is so important to consider is that basically, like we talked about asymptomatic before, 26% of the, of the contagions happen before there are symptoms. So, that if there's anything there, that is the, the in the defense of social distancing. That is in the defense of self isolation. That you have about a quarter of ca- contagions happen before there are symptoms. Another new research that just came out finds that more than ten percent of patients with COVID nineteen are infected by somebody who has the SARS CoV two but does not yet have symptoms. Okay, so that contradicts slightly. One says ten percent, one says twenty six percent. Well, okay, now we're finding a range that okay, maybe ten to twenty six percent of asymptomatic carriers, or rather, ten to ten to twenty six percent of people who get it are, get it from asymptomatic carriers, which is pretty serious, which is pretty significant because there are people who go on about their day to day life, like I might be right now, I might be carrying it, and I might give it to you. That's why social distancing from people who have it is very important. The growth rate, really important here. The growth rate has seen, as I said before, a, a consistent rise in cases from 5 to 15% each day over the last approximately four weeks worldwide. And people like to compare it to SARS. People like to compare it to MERS, which like we said before when we talked about comparing something, a, a static pieces of data versus a dynamic is, is a probabilistic, ineffective thing to do, just to be aware of it, we must consider that SARS infected about 8,000 people, right? Most of the patients infected with uh, COVID-19 were previously healthy with only uh, 32% have underlying conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, but 8,000 people is not a lot. We're looking at 150,000 plus right now. And just to, this uh, not on the topic of flu, sp- actually it is on the topic of flu spreadability. The Northern Hemisphere is going into warmer months. The Southern Hemisphere is going into winter, okay? I understand that the expert that came on Joe Rogan's podcast said that the seasonal, the implications of season are relatively null and void. Well, I would like to provide this, that perhaps that while the sa- South Equator South, south, the, 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 everybody below the equator is going to enter winter. This has implications because it can last longer on surfaces. It can live up to 28 days at 4 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature of the average fridge. Okay. Now let's talk about viability on surfaces while we're on the topic. The stability of a viable H, uh, the viability of the coronavirus on surfaces and aerosols in comparison with SARS coronavirus one. Okay, so the virus survives for up to nine days on surfaces such as metal, ceramics, and plastics at room temperature. Low temperature and high humidity increases lifespan, while high temperature and UV light, like from the sun, decreases lifespan. Okay, that's good to know. 
and now we're talking about the comparison. Overall, the stability is very similar to the coronavirus-19 and the SARS coronavirus-1. We found that viable virus could be detected in aerosols up to three hours post aerialization, up to four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard, two days on steel. So we talk about like a gym, okay, barbells, racks, and up to three days on plastic. Now, these are median figures. So there is a confidence interval up and down, so above it and below it. Consider that. So this gives clarity to why and how that R0 spreadability is so high. Right, which makes this virus quite insidu insidious, as I've said before, because it can stay on surfaces for so many days. Someone could come back here and touch this and then, then infect themselves. So we show that the stability uh, of this virus can remain on surfaces quite some time. Uh, taken together, our results indicate that aerosol and fomite transmission of the coronavirus-19 are plausible as the virus can remain viable on aerosols for multiple hours and on surfaces for days. Now, for people who don't know what an aerosol is and why this is actually very significant, is an aerosol is a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in the air or another gas. So aerosols can be can be natural, for example, like uh, fog, dust, um, steam, okay? And so what happens is that viruses when we breathe them out, when we cough, when we have sputum, which actually is not very common for this one, usually it's a dry cough, is part of the symptoms. But what can happen is that the virus can attach itself to, and, beca and can become aerosolized. It can attach itself to dust particles, okay? So that this is an argument for keeping a clean, dust-free environment or a dust minimal environment so that you can minimize the ability for potential pathogens viruses to attach to dust and aerosolize. Now, this is just good practice in general life. Like, this is just good to know in general. This is just preparing for future issues. So that's just good to know. Uh, now, we're going to talk about cleaning more in depth a bit later, but we know, and not many people are talking about, but bleach and hydrogen peroxide is effective at killing the viruses, the virus on surfaces. Okay? So that is important to consider. Instead of buying a thousand pieces of toilet paper, perhaps you should get something that actually cleans the virus, like some bleach or alcohol, like hydrogen peroxide, because you can't eat toilet paper. Toilet paper ain't going to disinfect. You can't feed your kids with toilet paper. Perhaps get some food and something to clean water if the services go out at some point in your life. I'm not just talking about today. I'm saying it will happen. All right. Now, a really important point about the numbers. People look at the numbers of the coronavirus and any virus that is happening in real time. We must understand that the real time official numbers are always behind true daily cases because we can only figure them out by looking backwards in hindsight. And that is that becomes more and more true and less and less, more and more true if the virus is more and more spreadable. And that becomes less true depending on if it's less spreadable, okay? And moreover, the more asymptom, the longer the incubation period and the more people are asymptomatic for, okay? So I'm gonna say that again. We must understand that daily real-time official numbers are always behind true daily cases because we can only figure them out by looking backwards in hindsight. The authorities don't know that somebody just has started having symptoms. They know when somebody goes to the doctor and gets diagnosed. Thus in that, asym in thus in that asymptomatic time and early symptom time when viral load is, is highest and spreadability is at its highest, that is the highest risk. That is when things spread. That is when you see two weeks later big explosions in cases like we, we are seeing in the US and like we we've seen in Italy. Because if you wait to get diagnosed before isolating yourself, before practicing good hygiene and practicing these, these practical measures to mitigate spread, well, you are likely to contribute to a high amount of spread and skew the numbers in a disproportionate manner that's going to affect uh, an explosion of cases in the future. So this is an issue. You only know the official cases, not the true ones, but you need to know the true ones. And how can you estimate the true ones? Well, this guy uh, who created this 
ama- amazing tool online. It created a model that you can input the numbers of your area, um, of how many people are infected, how many people have died. And he's worked, and this is the same guy who wrote the article early in the, art, uh, the, the 30 million view article on medium.com. In that article, he created a model because he's an engineer. And he, in this model, you can determine the likelihood that someone around you is infected and the actual true numbers based on all the data points that we have. Brilliant, brilliant model. If you actually want to know the truer numbers that we're dealing with now, then 100% check that out. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing piece, the tool he has created, and I commend uh, this guy so much for, for creating that. So thank you. Um, now, let's talk about symptoms. What are the common symptoms? Uh, a dry cough, a fever, most people will feel these symptoms for around five days and then majority of people will recover. We know about 80% of people will receive moderate, mild symptoms and recover. Okay. Earlier on, uh, these are statistics from earlier on in January, February from China, uh, we looked at, there was a smaller study that found that pneumonia um, was very, very common. Fever was almost 100%. Pneumonia was pretty much 100%. A cough was majority of fatigue was nearly half of the people um, over half of the patients received shortness of breath headache in around 10 percent diarrhea at three percent um, but now that's from one study done earlier on in china now what is quite interesting that must be considered is that at least 10 percent have reported hospitalized patients presented with gi symptoms so gastrointestinal symptoms those cases ended up infecting large amounts of healthcare workers because no one expected it was SARS coronavirus. So they were acting normal. They were, act, they were treating the gastrointestinal symptoms without considering that, obviously, it could have been a contagious virus. And so that has been a contributing factor. So if you're experiencing GI symptoms all of a sudden, along with any of the other ones, perhaps something to consider. Now, on the topic of symptoms and fever, a lot of people... Uh, are going out to buy non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, things like what we call Panadol in Australia or Nurofen. And so this has been known amongst health professionals for quite some time, but fever and a temperature is good in the majority of cold and flu cases. I'm not talking about non-cold and flu cases, okay? What is, the, what is the fever doing? The fever is killing the virus. It is sterilizing your environment, trying to kill the virus because we know that viruses do not like high temperature and that 40, around 40 degrees Celsius sterilizes and kills the virus. And we know the body temperature of a human being is around 36.8 degrees Celsius, around 37 degrees. So when you get that fever and you rise that temperature up a couple of degrees, then you help kill the virus. And that's why anti-inflammatories, all these people going out and buying all these anti-inflammatories, Panadol, this and that, can be so counterintuitive. You want the fever. Now, that is with mild to moderate cold and flu symptoms and a mild to moderate fever. If you are experiencing more severe symptoms, please see your doctor. I am not a doctor, okay? So see your doctor and get their professional expertise okay but let's at least paint the picture that a fever that the world has painted and and society and and these pharmaceutical companies have sold to you that you need to reduce your fever because you want to suppress your symptoms ride it out going to be a little uncomfortable but you're probably going to do a more effective job at killing a potential virus and cold and flu do your own research if you want to know more so children Interestingly, what many people were concerned about was children getting infected and dying, infants, etc. Actually, infants and children, slightly different because the pulmonary surfactant in their respiratory uh, function is going to be quite a bit lower in infants. But let's talk about children. So children 10 and younger appear to be largely protected by this. Okay, There are some theories why. Perhaps they don't have the same binding receptors, ACE2 binding receptors, um, or they don't have as many, 
or they're not as mature. It's highly speculative, speculative though. We don't know. But ten, but statistically, we know and we've seen that 10 years and under seem to be rather either asymptomatic or they're very mild symptoms. But here's the problem. Children are carriers. Now, the ability for them to spread and the, the, uh, how much viral load they have, we don't know exactly. But they're still carriers and they can still give it to your par- the parents and the grandparents and the people who are older. And they can still touch things and spread because we all know children aren't the most hygienic. They're touching their mucous membranes, saliva. It's not all the time. They're always touching and spreading, right? So that is something to be seriously considerate of if you have a child or if you know someone who does that while, okay, you can be safe, they're probably, they're probably going to be okay, and they're probably not going to uh, have any severe illnesses, which is great and amazing and such a good consequence of this that they can be carriers. Now, what if you're young and healthy? So I've heard many times, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'll be fine. And, and while I'm still confident in that statistic and in that uh, evidence that that is relatively true, that you can exercise every day, eat whole foods, eat plants, get great sleep, and tick all these boxes. But we are not immune. Nor, we're not immune to the virus, nor its complications. And although the probability is much lower, there have been and will be more people in their 20s and 40s, 20s to 40s, who will get sick, seriously ill, and or die. It's happened. Yeah, the statistic's much lower, but it's just a matter of time. You don't want to be that statistic. Because someone who said that died. Someone who said that got seriously ill. Someone who was complacent. I can't happen to me. I am, they might have thought, I'm the fittest out there. I'm the strongest out there. The most resilient David Goggins guy out there. Sorry. Virus doesn't care. It does and it doesn't. And what I say doesn't care, I mean it doesn't discriminate on who it's going to give it to. Well, it does, it's going to have a much harder job at taking you out. It can still take you out. It is, it, is, it is a question of which one of us that it will be. And you could be asymptomatic and transmit it to individuals who aren't going to be as lucky. This is the point. It is selfish. It is completely selfish to only think of yourself in this situation. Oh, I'm fine. I'll be fine. Yeah, you probably will be. We are saying about you. This is about the family, the, the parents, the grandparents, the person who's suffering from a wide variety of comorbidities. Then you transmit that to others. Then they transmit it to others. And there's a cascade of transmissions that could have been curtailed if we applied a conservative paradigm of thinking compared to the haphazard, I'll be fine, it doesn't matter. We need to think beyond ourselves. This is more than an individual thing. This is a population, community, worldwide-based thing. Who says the person you didn't give it to is not flying somewhere next week? And could become a super carrier, a super host. You want to talk about super hosts? I'll tell you about super hosts. A super spreader, rather. Patient 31 in South Korea. There is a, uh, on, on graphics, uh, there's a website that documented called the Korean Clusters. So, and it has an amazing graph that, that documented this on, on why patient 31 spread to, they calculate, 1,160 contacts that, that this person had. Okay, I was like, why does South Korea have such a huge spike? Well, patient 31 is a big reason. It's not clear where person, patient 31 became infected with the virus, but in the days before her diagnosis, she traveled to crowded spots uh, in Daegu. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, as well as the capital of Seoul. On February 6th, she was in a minor traffic accident. She checked herself in to the Oriental Medi- uh, Medicine Hospital. Or at the hospital, she attended services uh, in, in that branch uh, because hospitals have churches. So she attended the church service. Um, on February 9 and again on February 16. In between the visits, on February 15, doctors at the hospital said they first suggested she be tested for the coronavirus as she had a high fever. Instead, the woman went about a buffet lunch with a friend at a hotel. In an interview with a local uh, paper, the woman denied that doctors had advised her to be tested. So she's denying that they advised her to be tested, okay? Obviously trying to protect herself. As her symptoms worsened, however, doctors said once again, and advised her to be tested. On February 17, she finally went to another hospital for the test. The next day, health authorities announced she was the country's 31st confirmed case. In only a matter of days, those numbers had soared as hundreds of people at that church and the surrounding areas tested positive. Now, it's very hard to determine the exact 
quality and veracity of how many people she infected. But this case account, this, this case account is a clear example of how many people are thinking. You know, or I don't need to get tested. I'm fine. Uh, it's not going to affect me. I'm just going to do everything as normal. There is a cl- there's clear examples, and here is one, patient 31, super spreader, right here, who had an impact on over a thousand people because of her negligence, because of her denial, because of her nihilistic attitude. Whatever combination of thoughts that she had. And that is why I started this conversation. Nah, it's a conversation with myself. Rather, I started this dialogue with the framework of how to think about all this. Now, so hopefully that should dispel the idea that, you know, while you get healthy and young, you should be fine. Yeah, well, it's much more than you. It's, it's about who you could potentially transmit it to. And the potential is very important to consider. So I had a note in here. I've been collecting these. I've been note-taking this just by nature. I'm a, a note take a lot helps me remember i made a note that someone said wuhan will peak in a month the rest of china one two months later and then the rest of the world and i thought about that originally i'm like huh i wonder you know where we'll be when that happens because they were right no one really not many people really predicted that the world would peak like this some people did but a lot of people were went about their lives and didn't really think about it there's a quote by Paul Graham. People aren't surprised when I tell them there are 13,000 COVID-19 cases outside of China or when I tell them this numbers doubles every day. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Let me start that again. People aren't surprised when I tell them there are 13,000 COVID-19 cases outside of China or when I tell them this number doubles every three days. But when I tell them that if the growth continues at this rate, we'll have 1.7 million cases in three weeks, they're astonished. 1.7 million. Now, I don't... I don't know if we'll have that many, right? But the way we're going, it seems to be trending in that direction. But it all depends on the efforts of the communities, countries, and the individuals around the world. The better job we do at this, the lower the numbers will be, and the more the other people will say, you were wrong, I was right. This wasn't as serious. And guess what? That's good. I want to be told that. Because it's the efforts of the people who are telling you to take it seriously that helped make you be correct. That's what we want. I want you to be right. I want you to tell me I was wrong. Because that's the best case scenario. I don't want there to be 1.7 million cases, but Paul Graham, might be, you might be right. We'll see. And there's people hoping on a vaccine. They are, they are crossing their fingers that there will be a vaccine very, very soon. I heard uh, Donald Trump President Donald Trump, he uh, talked about a vaccine would come, he used the word soon, right, in, in some form or another. And every single expert I have heard is saying the opposite. To process a vaccine, one, needs to be developed, two, it needs to be studied for safety and uh, efficacy in animals, then in humans, and then it needs to be distributed. As of March 2020, animal studies are beginning And end of 2020, early 2021, they are projecting a vaccine to be created. That is David Hyman, a professor at the Infectious Disease of Epidemiology. That ain't soon. Limitation. What is the limitation of creating a vaccine? Well, with respect to the coronavirus vaccines, there is a risk of what's called immune enhancement. Immune enhancement is where a vaccine could actually make things worse. And we've seen this in in lab animals which is similar to the 1960s respiratory uh, syncotile virus, RSV vaccine, which inactivated vaccine in which vaccine recipients did worse and ended up with more hospitalizations. So there is a risk and limitation with the coronavirus vaccines that they need to test vigorously to make sure it is safe to put in humans. Because... Definitely, there's going to be cases where people aren't going to respond favorably, but they have to maximize the efficacy and safety. So now we're all pretty much at a point that it's not a matter of if, it's a a matter of when we get forced quarantine. And there are rules where all these 
nice shops and restaurants have to be forced to be closed. And it seems to be it's happening country after country after country. I don't want it to happen here. And I'm going to do everything in my power to, to help educate and have this conversation so we can mitigate it. But we must prepare for it because we cannot depend that the people around us are all going to adhere to a practical, common sense, proactive ideology. Now let's talk about the actual numbers. We did a little bit before, but let's talk about the actual numbers. That uh, Professor Neil Ferguson, uh, epidemiologist and disease modeler, estimates 10% or less of the cases were in China were being detected. 25% outside of China, and really around 50,000 new cases per day in China, doubling every five days. So he estimated this back when... Uh, over about a month ago in February when the rest of the world hadn't really touched, hadn't really experienced the spread of this virus. And he warned against that the spread is much more than it is appearing to be. We didn't listen. The majority didn't listen. In the case reports versus actual reports, we must please don't assume that the number of coronavirus cases being reported in the U.S. equals the number of cases in the U.S. There's so little testing going on, we're flying blind. So as testing capacity increases, the case numbers could jump substantially. And let's talk about testing. Testing is done via nasal, uh, nasal swab and takes around four hours in the best case scenario to receive back as of March uh, 15, 2020. Okay, 75 to 80 percent of transmissions in China were in family clusters. And this is why home isolation is dangerous in a family. But beneficial in a wider community if everybody stays put. So alternatively, quarantine centers and quarantine hotels are being created around the world and are probably a better bet. So that is probably something I should have mentioned earlier with transmissions. But it gives you an idea to extrapolate out to the outside world, outside of China, that nearly 80% of cases operate in family clusters. So if someone in your home gets it, you've got to do the best you can um, because you're likely to get it. And then hopefully you don't spread it to others if you're careful. Many people with all symptoms are refused testing due to the lack of travel exposure. And we're experiencing right that, that now in Melbourne, Australia. And this unfortunately skews the numbers in a downward direction. What this means is that you get a false sense of, how, of, of security that there aren't as many people as infected as you think there are. Which is why the modeling by the engineer that I mentioned earlier is really important to look at and to input and put your numbers in and see more accurate numbers of what's going on. In the Bay Area, uh, there was testing for everybody, so San Francisco, for those who don't know, there was testing for everybody who had traveled or was in contact with the traveler, which means that they, they knew most of the travel-related cases, but none of the community spread as they knew. By having a sense of community spread versus travel spread, you know how many true cases there are. You need to be able to distinguish the difference, and if you're not testing for the community spread for the people who hadn't traveled, then you're doing yourself and your country and your state a disservice because you're either going to wait until people end up severely ill so those people present severely ill symptoms and then you have to do the test in the hospital that means you have to wait more and that they, they go down the, the path of getting sicker and potentially infecting more people so that's a limitation right there another limitation that gives the, the, as I said at the society a false sense of security that things aren't as bad or, uh, as they seem and things are usually always worse than they seem earlier on in, a, in the spreadability of a virus like this However, like we talked about before, the case fatality ratio also usually is worse than it seems. So case fatality ratio is usually better, okay? But spreadability and case fatality ratio are two different things. And both have inferences on, on a variety of different implications in our society and as an individual. So the US has been criticized for being way behind in testing, um, which is obviously a huge important part of containment and mitigation. As of March 10, the USA state local public health Labs across 50 states now have the capacity to test up to 75,000 people for the coronavirus. We just don't know how they're being distributed as of yet. Now, as we uh, ending in the tail end of this of this of this video, the long-term side effects. 
what are the long-term side effects? Because pe- while people say, hey, I'm young, I'm healthy, uh, I'm fine. Well, we just don't have enough data to know the long-term side effects confidently. But the long-term side effects seem to be pointing in a pretty unfortunate bad direction that that if someone was to get and was to recover, you'd rather not have. You really don't want to have. So let's talk about it. Comparative data related to SARS and MERS seems to imply that a persistent lung damage in some recovered COVID-19 patients could be possible. Let's just take that. You don't want that. I don't want lung damage. I don't want persistent lung damage. I don't care if it's for a year or six months. I don't want that. I don't want, li- I don't want limited tidal volume. I don't want a uh, limiter put on my respiratory function. That's going to affect my day-to-day life and ability to exercise. Let's just say, hypothetically, that affects 5% of cases that are fully recovered. That's a lot of people. Someone listening could have that. So if so, if that is true, there is more to consider than just mortality percentage. There's more to consider than this. And here is one of the, the many links sent to me and that I received. And this one's uh, from Tim Ferriss. Okay. Ultimately, the authors of this article recommend CT for follow-up in patients recovering from COVID-19 to evaluate long-term or even permanent pulmonary damage, including fibrosis, as seen in SARS and MERS infections. Here's another one, published in Nature, one of the most well-regarded articles. If you ever see an article or a research paper in Nature, there's a very high impact factor. Impact factors is a measurement of the quality of a research journal or a journal. So it also, it references how many times a paper is referenced. So very good uh, journal, number one. Uh, there is no consensus as we have little to no data on COVID-19 and won't have data on the long-term outcomes for months, if not years. For my decision-making, this is more dangerous until proven safe, not safer until proven more dangerous. And this is the mentality you must have if you don't want to get caught off guard. You want to get, it might not happen to you, you might not get caught off guard. You might have your, your, your mentality, your mentality of, of um, more dangerous until proven safer, not safer until proven more dangerous, right? You got to consider that. You don't want to get caught off guard. You don't want to be that person who says, you don't want to get told, I told you so, by somebody or a virus or, or, or something that happened to you. Another implication is chronic organ damage, okay? There was a article published in Nat Geo, uh, which is not obviously... Uh, uh, journal like the Lancet or Nature, but um, during the third phase, lung damage continues to build, which can result in respiratory failure. Even if death doesn't occur, some patients survive with permanent lung damage. According to the WHO, SARS punched holes in the lungs, giving them a honeycomb like appearance, and these lesions are present in those affected by the novel coronavirus. Not good. I've had several doctors discussing possible lung damage like pulmonary fibrosis and cardiac scarring if indeed possible this would be substan- this would substantially change the risk profile of the disease most of my friends in their 30s and 40s are effectively saying ah, my wife and kids will be fine look at the mortality rate for our age groups but i'm not sure this is a complete assessment of risk and this is really important that tim ferris points out and he he's a brilliant thinker in the way he analyzes risk i think uh, and that the risk profile is dynamic it is in flux because the outcomes and the the outcomes that we're basing our risk assessment on are in flux rather and so if you make a static risk asse- assessment that underestimates then you put yourself at a higher risk you put yourself you're you're, you're on the back foot you would rather overestimate have a higher risk profile and be wrong because the consequences of being the consequences of being uh, wrong in the face of incorrectly evaluating data and evidence and underestimating is, is, as I've said, 
is the worst situation to be in. You don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to have to deal with potential chronic organ damage. You don't want to have to deal with potential lung damage. <sighs> All right. Uh, a caveat and a side note um, that I was listening to at the ATP Science Podcast, which is a brilliant podcast uh, and, and supplement company by co-owned by some Australians. Um, they, they mentioned the hygiene hypothesis. And it's really important to actually mention that because we're going to notice some long-term side effects potentially from obsessive hygiene. And so the hygiene hypothesis states that a lack of early childhood exposure to infectious agents, symbiotic microorganisms like bacteria and parasites increase susceptibility to allergic diseases by suppressing the natural development of the immune system. This is by the Professor of Pediatrics of Molecular Virology and Microbiology, Dr. Peter Hattes has mixed feelings about it. It's not airtight, and it is a hypothesis. But we may see a increase, a substantial increase in the allergies and eczema with all the antimicrobial soaps being used now, especially amongst young kids who may be practicing these habits for years to come. We may see a sharp rise in allergies and autoimmune issues in the coming years after this. Why is this important? Well, a lot of autoimmune issues and allergies, they are there are chronic debilitating um insidious kind of thing that affects you on a day-to-day basis it's like it's like being pinpricked like every every minute every hour just being annoyed by this autoimmune issue you have and so understanding that and using more natural modalities supplement supplementing with pro and pre, probiotics and having prebiotic foods to create a a optimal not optimal or rather a yeah a more optimal microbiome environment is going to be important uh so the next topic that we're going to talk about is the effects of an overwhelmed healthcare system because we can talk about the individual, we can talk about the community, we can talk about the healthcare implication, health, health implications, the long-term implications on health. But your negligence to not talk about, to not acknowledge this, this virus and not acknowledge a virus can have significant implications on a healthcare system. The reality is per capita of individuals, versus per capita of beds is limited. One reason they think Italy was overwhelmed so much, there was a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is because their their ceiling, how much room they had to move versus people in the beds versus how many beds they had available was small. So they got overwhelmed very quickly because quickly they weren't prepared because not a lot of hospitals have enough beds per person. A country and a city and a hospital is not prepared for if... Even like 1% of their population have to go go into the hospital because 1% of a 26 million population in Australia is a huge number, right? Especially if a majority of those have to be hospitalized. So another thing to consider is that we have to, like the medical staff that are, that are at the forefront of this, so much respect and thank you and gratitude to, to, to you guys. You guys are, are doing a hell of a job and a lot of you guys are getting sick. And some of you are dying because you're, you're you're just exposed to so many different people. And so we really need to come around our medical staff and anybody who's, who's in that profession and really give them as much support, emotional, psychological, verbal support as possible because they are at the forefront of this. And I heard a statement by, by, by a medical pr- practitioner. He said, um, what if we fail? All of you are relying on us. What if we fail? And it's a very sobering thought because failure can expose itself in many different ways and one includes getting sick, quitting. I'm sure there's been people who have been like, I'm not dealing with this. I'm going to take care of my family. I'm sure there's been people who have uh, gotten emotionally overwhelmed and had to take time off. They just couldn't cope with it. In Italy, I'll read you guys some, some stuff that is quite daunting because uh the ramifications of this is if you lose say 10 percent of your medical team in a hospital because they're getting sick the knock-off effect of your ability to provide care reduces by much more than uh reduces by much more than 10 percent so you lose 10 percent of the staff the effect of it is going to be much more than 10 percent because how many people a medical how many people one single medical professional can affect in a single day is huge like dozens to hundreds 
maybe more, depending on the, the, the professional. And so it's had a serious implications of a limiting medical staff don't just affect the people with COVID. And this is another thing. You might still not care about it. It's going to affect you if you have to go to the hospital or someone you know has to go to the hospital because it, it's affecting all the other people with all the other illnesses. In Italy, they're having to choose. They're having to choose who they treat, who lives, who dies. And that is a dramatic statement. And how accurate that statement is, is hard to test unless you're really there and speak to someone who's been there on the ground. But I'm going to try and get you guys some recounts, trying to get some, uh, some, some cases here, some, some real anecdotal evidence to explain the situation. But for example, let's say you do your ACL and you want to get ACL surgery. Oh, guess what? Elective surgeries have been suspended in Seattle. Sorry. You're going to have to wait. You're going you're to have to wait until we stop dealing with this. And, and this is a signal of more things to come. If elective, surgery, elective, surgery, ugh, elective surgeries have been suspended in Seattle, why can't that um, extrapolate out to more countries, more, more cities in America, more states in America, rather? What about the people who get in car accidents? What about the person who broke his leg or has other type of trauma? These people are going to be prioritized differently. These people might be your brother, your sister, your mother, your friend. And so if you care about them, then you ha we have an obligation to be proactive, to implement measures that mitigate the spread of a virus. Because there are people still getting car accidents, having cardiovascular disease, getting heart attacks, cancer. But now there is so much pressure now. There is an increased amount of demand and pressure because care is being prioritized differently as the healthcare system gets stress tested and the worst case it gets overwhelmed. And that's when it really hits the fan. That's what we don't want. But it's happening in Italy and it will happen. And some people suspect it's going to happen in America in a lot of states like Washington. We don't want that to happen. And so this is why it has never been more important to implement measures that mitigate, that mitigate the spread. So I'm going to read you, actually, before I read you the uh, anecdote, I'm going to explain that healthcare workers, they're having to spend often all day in their protective gear and there's not enough for them. And as a result, they can't leave the infected areas for hours. And a lot of them, I'm hearing, are crumbling, dehydrated, and exhausted. Shifts don't exist anymore. People are driven back from retirement to cover needs. People who have no idea about nursing are trained overnight to fulfill critical roles. Everybody's on call, always. This is happening in some parts of the world. And this could happen in your city, in your state. The worst is in the ICUs when patients need to share ventilators or ECMOs. These are, in fact impossible to share. So the healthcare workers must determine what patient will use it. That really means which one lives and which one dies. After a few days, we have to choose. Not everyone can be in incubated. We decide based on age and state of health. Christian, Solori, Italian, MD. I'm going to read you a recount from Jason Van Shaw on Twitter. From a well-respected friend and intensivist, A&E consultant who is currently in Northern Italy. This is on March 10, five days ago from recording this. I feel pressure to give you a quick personal update about what is happening in Italy and also give some quick direct advice about what you should do. Firstly, Lombardy is mostly a developed region in Italy and has the most extraordinary good healthcare I have worked in Italy, UK, and Australia, and don't make the mistake to think that what is happening is happening in a third, that what is happening here is happening in a third world country. So Italy, let's consider, has one of the best healthcare systems in the, in the world. The current situation is difficult to imagine, and the numbers do not explain things at all. Where have you heard that before? Interesting. Our hospitals are overwhelmed by coronavirus-19. They are running at 200% capacity. We've stopped all routine, all uh, ORs have been converted to ITUs, intensive um, treatment units, and they are now diverting or not treating all the other emergencies like trauma or strokes. There are hundreds of patients with severe respiratory failure and many of them do not have access to anything above a reservoir mask. If that is true, 
which I don't have, I don't see any reason for an individual to personally lie or be fictitious about the recount of something like this when it's not even delivered via them directly. It's a secondary source. Let's say it's true. They are diverting or not treating all other emergencies like trauma or strokes. You better not have a stroke anytime soon. Oh, wait. Sometimes you don't get to pick. Patients above 65 or younger with comorbidities are not even assessed by the ITU. I'm not saying not tubed. I'm saying not assessed and no ITU staff attends when they arrest. Now, I don't know if he means cardiac arrest. If he does, that's, that's incredibly serious. If you're talking about someone having a cardiac arrest in a hallway or in a room and you have no one to attend to, that's worst case scenario. Staff are working as much as they can, but they are starting to get sick and are emotionally overwhelmed. My friends call me in tears because they see people dying in front of them and they can only conf- offer some oxygen. Ortho and orthopedic uh, surgeons and pathologists are being given a leaflet and sent to see patients on NIV. Please stop to read this again and think. I don't know what NIV means, but some of you will. We have seen the same pattern in different areas a week apart, and there is no reason that in a few weeks it won't be the same everywhere. This is the pattern. A few positive cases, first mild measures, people are told to lower, uh, to avoid uh, ED, but still hang out in groups. Everyone starts, says not to panic, two. Some moderate respiratory failures and a few severe ones that need to, but regular access to emergency department is significantly reduced, so everything looks great. Three, tons of patients with moderate respiratory failure that over time deteriorate and saturate intensive care units, then NIVs, then CPAP hoods, then even O2. Staff gets sick, so it gets difficult to cover for shifts, mortality spikes, also from all the other causes that can be treated properly. Everything about how to treat them is online, but the only things that will make a difference are do not be afraid of massively strict measures to keep people safe. We keep hearing this again and again from the smartest people that I I, I know. I I don't think it's a mistake that all these people are erring on the side of caution that we should take more action than less action. If governments won't do this, at least keep your family safe. Your loved ones with a history of cancer or diabetes or any transplant will not be tubed if they need it, even if they are young. By safe, I mean you. Do not attend them and you decide who does and you teach them how to. Another typical attitude is to read and listen to people saying things like, that's a bad attitude, and then go out to dinner because you think you'll be safe. We have seen it and you won't be We have seen it. You won't be if you don't take it seriously. I really hope it won't be as bad as here, but prepare. Prepare. That is a message. It might not happen in your city, and it might happen in your state, but we we, we should prepare. At least prepare for the fact that this is a dry run for something more serious. It's going to happen. Not matter if, it's a matter when. So all of this is what drives a system to have a fatality ratio of 4 to 5% instead of a half percent. If you want your city or country to be a part of a 4%, don't do anything. Don't do anything. If you want your system to be, or if you don't care about your system, excuse me, your medical system being overwhelmed, don't do anything. You just sit back and act as if nothing is going on. And then chaos will likely ensue. To give context around Italy, they're looking at about a 7 to 8% case fatality ratio. China was at about 2 to 3%. So why is the case fatality ratio so different? It's important to note that we can't you can't compare your country to Italy because it's different. Every country has different variables and uh, subsets of populations. So w- number one, Italy has a higher prevalence of smokers and a higher prevalence of older population. 22% of the Italian population are 65, 65 years and older. And moreover, like I said before, their medical system was closer to total capacity when the explosion of cases hit, so they had far less headroom to move than other countries. Moreover, I've had a, I have had have a personal friend whose family uh, lives in Italy, and she's telling me the same story that they're having to choose who 
they get, when we spoke, they were at a point where they were getting to the point where they had to choose about who they can help and who they can't. Now, they're most certainly at that point. You can imagine being completely locked down. The hospital situation, it's not good. They did a, the Italian College of Anesthesia um, released a uh, extraordinary medical do- do- document. It was in Italian, but then it got converted by somebody um, that purported what's going on and that some hospitals are so overwhelmed that they simply cannot treat every patient. They are starting to do wartime triage. Here's the guidance for that. It may be necessary to establish criteria of access to intensive care, not just on the basis of clinical appropriateness, but inspired by the most consensual criteria regarding distributive justice and the appropriate allocation of limited health resources. This scenario is substantially comparable to field of catastrophe medicine, for which ethical reflection has over time stipulated many uh, many concrete guidelines for doctors and nurses facilitating difficult choices. In a context of grave shortage of medical resources, the allocation criteria need need to guarantee that those patients with the highest chance of therapeutic success will retain access to intensive care. Okay, you need to hear that. The patients with the highest chance of therapeutic success will retain access to intensive care. It is a matter of giving priority to the highest hope of life and survival. That is what the, that's where they're at. That is the mentality where they're at in Italy. I'm thankful that I don't live there because now the stakes are much, much higher between who lives and who dies. If you're talking about the difference between Let's say your father just had a heart attack, has diabetes, and has high blood pressure. And you don't. You're healthy. Everything's great for you. You both go into the hospital. And, and they have to choose between you and him? Or a situation like you and him? You, you, you're, you're getting picked. You have the higher therapeutic chance of survival. That's a dice roll. That is a dice roll. You're not dice rolling people's lives. This is a uh, one last thing to demonstrate the brevity of the issue because people don't think it can happen where they're at. And I'm telling you, most likely, all the projections and trajectories point towards this happening in other countries. I don't know if this will happen here in Australia. I don't know where it will happen in America, but I suspect it will in at least one state. Woman on Facebook, um, who is kind of at the heart of uh, coronavirus, so just an individual, um, just recounting her first-hand experience. She says, I can hear you now. It's, ju- it's just the flu. It, it only affects people with preconditions. There are two reasons why coronavirus has brought Italy to its knees. First, it is a flu. and It is devastating when people get really sick because they need weeks of ICU. And second, because of how fast and effectively it spreads. There is two-week incubation period and many who, who have never shown symptoms when prime minister when their prime minister last night locked down the country 60 million people the line that struck me the most was that he said there was no more time there is no more time because to be to be clear this national lockdown is a hail mary when he means that what he means is that if these numbers of contagion do not start to go down the system of italy will collapse now look when people are emotional, they, they tend to exaggerate the situation. It's hard to clear, think clearly. So how accurate that is, we'll see. But today, the ICUs in Lombardy are at capacity, more than capacity. And when I am say today, I mean like almost a week ago. They have begun to put ICU units in the hallways. If numbers do not go down, the growth rate of contagions tell us that there will be thousands of people who in a matter of a week, two weeks, will need care. What will happen when there are 100 or 1,000 people who need hospital and only a few ICU places left? On Monday, a doctor wrote in the paper that they have begun to decide who lives and who dies when the patients show up in the emergency room, like what is done in like what is done in war. This will only get worse. There are finite numbers of doctors, nurses, and medical staff, and they are getting the virus too. They have also been working nonstop for days. What happens when the doctors and nurses and medical staff are simply not able to care for the patients when they are not there? What happens if they fail? My thoughts are with everybody in Italy and who has relatives in Italy and even all around the world, let's be real. So, finally, we must conclude. What should you do? 
or we've talked a little about it before, but let's really summarize it. This is a pandemic now. It can't be eliminated, but what we can do is reduce its impact. If we reduce the infections as much as possible, our healthcare system will be able to handle cases much better, driving the fatality rate down. If we spread this over time, we will reach a point where the rest of society can be vaccinated, eliminating the risk altogether. So our goal is not to eliminate the coronavirus uh, contagions. It's to postpone its severity. We want to flatten the curve. It's a very fat tail distribution. We want to flatten that. The more we can postpone cases, the better healthcare system can function. The lower the mortality rate and the higher the share of the population will be, va- be vaccinated before it gets infected. That's what we need. So, some things you can do. Some things I've, and I wouldn't say these things if I didn't already be doing them. Social distancing. There's one very simple thing we can all do. And if you go to the Wuhan graph, uh, in the article um, written by the gentleman I mentioned earlier, you'll remember that as soon as there was a lockdown, cases went down. That's because people didn't interact, interact with each other. If you're questioning social isolation, social distancing, you shouldn't because it's effective. We've seen it's been effective in China. We, we know that if you're in contact with less people, you're going to spread the virus less. The current scientific consensus is that the virus can, can be spread within two meters, six feet, if somebody coughs. Otherwise, the droplets fall to the ground and don't infect you. However, there is evidence that it can be aerosolized as well. So that may not be particularly accurate depending on the uh, effectiveness of the aerosolization. The worst infection, the most common infection, becomes through surfaces. The virus can be surf- can be survive on surfaces up to nine days. The median is five point. Uh, if I recall correct, is that five point one? No, it's actually that's not correct. I'm remembering a different stat. The virus can survive on surfaces up to nine days. Metal, ceramics, and plastics all have different um, uh, data points on how many days. But we're talking about doorknobs. Look, I just t- I just touched my nose, right? But the mucous membranes we have are really important to minimize touching, like fingers in mouth, fingers in, fingers in, uh, like licking fingers, like people do when they turn pages. Doorknobs, table, uh, tables, elevator buttons, things we touch a lot, you know, doing things where you can you mitigate uh, touch to spread potential viruses. And again, this is just basic hygiene. This is just a good idea in general. It's just, if anything, what comes of this is just a reminder just to be generally more hygienic because we can be pretty, pretty, pretty nasty human beings. But the main way to, to, to mitigate is, is social distancing, keeping people at home as much as possible for as long as possible until it recedes to facilitate what we call mitigation. And mitigation requires heavy, heavy social distancing. So people need to stop hanging out in large groups to drop the transmission rate. Once we drop it to below one, the R naught of below one, we're doing really good. It dies out then. The, these measures require uh, close uh, closing companies, shops, mass transit, schools, enforcing lockdowns. The worse your situation, the worse the social distancing. The earlier you impose heavy measures, the less time you need to keep them. The easier it is to identify brewing cases and the fewer people get infected. This is what Wuhan had to do. This is what Italy was forced to accept because when the virus is rampant, the only measure is to lock down all the infected areas to stop spreading it all at once. With thousands of official cases and tens of thousands of true ones, this is what countries like Iran, France, Spain, Germany, Switzerland, the US need to do. You don't want to be caught in the back foot. But majority of the world is getting caught in the back foot now. People, they... I'm not going to say laughed. People laughed, people laughed at people who were buying food supplies earlier on. Month, pe- People were warning about this, and I've been watching very closely since early January, because you, you, you don't want to get caught off guard. It's like a natural disaster. You don't want to you don't want to hear the sirens when the tsunami is a minute away. I want to hear those sirens. I want to know that stuff's coming a week away, a month away. I want to be prepared. So this represents a tsunami, and we have different tidal waves and tsunamis coming. In each individual country, the, 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 the depth, width, and size of each tsunami is different in each country. But some people are just only responding about it now. So you see those panic buys, don't you? You see the panic buys of people going to buy a bunch of medication, food, supplies. Man, you should have done that a month ago. In fact, 
you should have at least two to four weeks of food, period. You don't know when service is going to get disrupted. You don't know when we're going to get a solar flare. Oh, you want to talk about that for a minute? A solar flare can, knock, can create an EMP that can knock out half the world, the whole world even, electricity and electronics. Oh, then we're really in some, in, in some, in some shit right now, aren't we? What if, that, what if a natural disaster occurs while this is happening? Nature don't care. It's going to happen. Tsunamis, earthquakes, hurricanes, typhoons. And it happens in an area where people aren't very mobile. People can't get out. People are sick. People are isolated. People have to stay in home to be healthy. But now they have to come together because now all their homes are destroyed. We've seen that with hurricanes before where people all live in isolation together in these giant gymnasiums because they no longer have homes. Huh. Yeah, that'll probably happen. Not a great timing, but you need to prepare for that. All these measures will slow down the virus. They will lower the transmission rate, and that's what we want. If we can do that and we can flatten this curve, then we can... We can do. We can. We can. We can get ahead of it before it gets ahead of us. And so, what can you do? Uh, we've talked about social isolation and mitigation, um, influenza mitigation. And so, there is a great article that I've put by the CDC that I've linked in the interim guidance for cleaning international port of authority in detention facilities when a pandemic influenza is suspected in a detainee, detainee or staff member. And so, basically, these. Uh, guidances give us influence, uh, give us uh, inferences on how we should clean our, our surfaces and to the greatest extent possible. And so we know viruses can persist on surfaces for more than 24 hours. Um, and so let's give you something practical, okay? If EPA registered disinfectants are not available, use a dilute solution of 1 to 100 volume, approximately 600 parts per million of household chlorine beach, bleach, or 6% sodium hypochloride to disinfect surfaces. To prepare the solution, quarter cup of bleach to a gallon of clean water. Okay, a gallon is 4.5 liters. So a quarter cup of bleach to 4.5 liters of water. Or two teaspoons of bleach to a quart. A quart is, one, is about one liter. Two teaspoons to a quart. Apply to clean surfaces and uh, you make sure it's really important to allow it to dry and wait at least three to five minutes. And definitely wear gloves um, where preparing the solution because bleach is a very harsh, harsh solution. And even um, has, it can even have some negative respiratory effects. Uh, so you can even wear a mask is recommended as well, depending on the frequency you're dealing with bleach. So bleach. And so that's what I've done. I've prepared my own bleach solution that I carry around with me. Okay. And so when it's really important, especially if you work in environments um, where you have like people are touching a lot of things like a gym. All right, you make sure you got to make sure that's clean. You got to make sure you, you spray that bleach, okay, to kill any potential bacteria, uh, viruses. Number two, uh, another one, hygiene, okay. And I'm aware that we're gonna talk about hygiene and masks real, uh, real quick, okay. Hygiene, um, yeah, coughing, cough hygiene, hand washing, yep, yeah, okay. You, most people got that part, uh, but most most people don't understand is that um, I recall that the guest on Joe Rogan, uh, I believe he didn't particularly argue for hand hygiene too much. And so I just would like to put this out there that we know viruses are pH sensitive. The skin is about, operated around a 6 pH. Soap is around a 10 pH. So it's much more alkaline than acidic. And that's effective at killing the virus. But we haven't obviously tested the pH for and responsiveness via soap to this specific COVID strain. But we can assume based on the underlying uh, research of viruses and pH that it would be effective. Uh, what's interesting is the, the alarming information by epidemiologic modeling that only 20% of people in airports um, had clean hands. Only 70% of people wash their hands after using the toilet. Of those who do wash, only half do it correctly using both water and soap and for at least 15 seconds. So we have a history of poor hygiene and poor hygiene practices that purport a continual um, spread of viruses. Now, the quite contentious issue, masks. 
Should you wear a mask? What type of masks are there? It's not a yes and no answer because there are different types of masks. So let's break it down. How a disease is spread informs what types of controls are useful in preventing its spread. If the disease can be spread by contact, preventing surfaces from becoming contaminated and hand hygiene will be very important. Tick, that's relevant. Surgical masks may be worn by infected people in order to help reduce the spread via inhaled aerosols. Okay, that's important because we know and what a lot of people aren't considering is that it can be aerosolized. COVID-19 can be aerosolized. I don't think we have utmost certainty to this point, but I think we have enough certainty that it's a high possibility depending on the environmental conditions. So, surgical masks, safety glasses and goggles, excuse me, and face shield may be useful to help shield the healthcare worker, healthcare workers' mucous membranes. Okay, that is from uh, 3M Technical Data Bulletin on the 3rd of February because they released this technical bulletin a really good one that describes the efficacy of uh, masks and how to mitigate spread, okay? So, this is particularly relevant to me. One, because I've studied uh, environmental uh, environmental exercise uh, f- physiology uh, in my university studies before. And, and in that, we talked about the effects of pollution and particulates in the air in affecting respiratory function. And so, what comes from that is masks the efficacy of using masks and what type of mask we use and and the size of partic- particulates um so we're going to break that down right now so particle size is often measured in what's called micrometers you're going to see that symbol that is like a, a u it's, it's like the shape of a u letter u with like a line on the left of it okay that's a symbol for micrometers and micrometers uh, they range from well, let's talk about the ones that are that are most uh, relevant. So particles particles smaller than five micrometers can enter the lung and are considered considered respirable fractions. Okay, there's a really good uh, diagram or photo rather that I've put in the document in the description of how big uh, one micrometer is. And so to give you some context, um, coronavirus is around 0.125 micrometers. Let's call it around 0.1 micrometers, okay? So, what we're looking at, um, a single human hair is around 20 to 40 micrometers, okay? A blood cell, 5 to 10 micrometers, bacteria around 1 micrometers, and it says here viruses around 30 to 50 nanometers. Okay, I'm glad I read that just in time. So, Let's not get confused with the symbols. So let's just compare it to some. This, let's just standardize the comparison. If bacteria is about one micrometer, we're looking at something that is much smaller than bacteria, around nine to ten times smaller than bacteria. Uh, so and then we need to talk about okay. So what is the efficacy for masks? While no respirator, and this is very important to mention, no respirator will prevent the inhalation of all particles such as virus and bacteria. Respirators cannot eliminate the risk of exposure to infection and an illness, all right? So there is a, it's like a confidence interval. They, they are 95, that's why it's called an N95. It has 95% efficiency or N99, 90, 99% or N100, 99.97% efficiency. And so let's talk about surgical masks real quick, okay? It's more likely to help than harm, okay? If you want to do everything you can, then it's better to have a mask than not have. Okay, a surgical mask, what is it used for? It's used uh, as an infection control device designed to help prevent the spread of infection from wearers' exhaled breath to potentially susceptible people. So if you have a flu or cold symptoms, then wearing a mask can help mitigate the spread of aerosolizing uh, your virus or, or putting any mucus, uh, putting any um, virus on a surface from coughing, for example. So it may help reduce the contamination of large droplets expelled by the wearer. Great, all right? That's good. We want that. It's, we shouldn't diminish masks if it can help reduce the spread. But I know it's a contentious issue uh, that is obviously not sufficient ev- evidence that a surgical mask, I'm going to talk about a surgical mask, I'm just talking about like a like a paper, not paper, but like a plastic mask that doesn't have any filtration on it. Um, but if you have symptoms, you may, theoretic- you may theoretically likely decrease your spread of of the virus from coughing and touching. That's great. You decrease the spread of the virus, everything else gets better. 
Now, what about filtration? What about a mask that filter? The primary question here is whether or not particulate respirators can filter small particles such as fungal spores like two to five micrometers or bacteria uh, or viruses, which are even smaller than bacteria, as I talked about, having this really small, you know, 0.1 uh, micrometer in size and the physical size of various organisms and you know is, is shown in this table I provided here so what is an N95 mask do okay what size does it filter out 0.3 the median the middle remember median middle is 0.3 micrometers so if we look at that we see that well it doesn't filter it doesn't filter enough it, the filtration isn't small enough to filter the coronavirus because it's 0.1 so it's it's essentially 0.2 off which is very small amount but hold on most particular filters have a region of lower filtration efficiency somewhere between 0.05 to 0.5 particles in this range are large enough to be less effectively pushed around by diffusion if you remember diffusion from your your uh, chemistry chemistry or bi uh, sorry biology rather um, substance from an area of high concentration to low concentration is diffusion right so to re reiterate the size of coronavirus 0.1 micrometers approximately the average the median filtration rate of an n95 mask is 0.3 and that is great for your particulates in the air for your pm 2.5 um, for help fil filtering out sulfur and CO2 and carbon, and carbon monoxide and all these um, particulates that build up from things like fires, like wildfires that we've had. So really good effectiveness for there. Um, but for viruses, let we need to consider that it has a lower filtration rate efficiency between 0 0.05 and that puts it in the range that it can filter out the coronavirus. It can filter out viruses. Now, you may say, well, it's May. You said it may filter out the coronavirus. Okay. Would you rather have nothing? I wouldn't. I would rather be moderately protected than not protected at all. I would rather, ha if I have to go out in public, I'd rather be moderately protected and wear a mask than not. If you want to read more about this stuff, you can go look at the 3M uh, document that I've um, referenced here. Because people seem to have been thrown masks out as, as, as useless, um, kind of misunderstanding what, what Michael, uh, that's the guy on Joe Rogan's podcast, Michael Ostenholm uh, said. People get it confused. He said surgical masks are hit and miss, paraphrasing. He said N95 masks are very effective. Me there's a reason medical professionals use them. Diseases can be transmitted via many routes, including inhalation of aer aerosols. When properly fitted, selected, used, and maintained, particulate removing respirators have been demonstrated to reduce the amount of aerosols, both bioaerosols and non-biological aerosols, that are inhaled by the wearer. In contrast, most surgical masks are not designed to seal tightly to the face. And research has been shown that they do not achieve the level of contamination reduction provided by a certified respirator that is used correctly. 3M Technical Data Bulletin, 3rd of February. If you think I speak too fast, see a little feature on your podcast and YouTube app? 0 0.05 times speed. 0 0.5 times speed. If you think I think it's too slow and you want to go through quicker, times two speed. It's there. So, N95 masks can be effective. Done. That, that should put it at rest. Unless the we discover that the coronavirus is actually much smaller in size, then N95 masks are effective. Hand washing is, is effective because of the pH. Um, surgical masks can be mildly effective but especially relevant to those who have uh cold and flu symptoms themselves to mitigate the spread and self-isolation is very effective so let's all consider those and if you look if you live in an area that gets fires you should definitely have an n95 mask anyway you should be prepared because we've had countries will have weeks and like china has been wearing these masks forever i mean even in india too because, like, especially when you get, you don't want to get caught, like, with bushfires causing terrible air for weeks and months, like we did. And then it's it's going to trigger people with respiratory issues. It triggers, like, asthma and, and respiratory issues. Like, you, you don't want that. 
So, finishing off, we'll be going for a very long time, but as you can see, this is not a black and white issue. I will do this until I'm, I'm in the ground, right? I will, I really I think it's important that we discuss the nuances and the, the in-depth components of complicated issues. We can't just headline read and just make assumptions based off that. As, as, look, I've done it, I've done it, but we have to critically analyze and critically evaluate information. And so that's why I've tried to distribute the best information from the best thinkers, from the widest, so the widest variety of sources, dozens and dozens of sources, and aggregate it all for, for the world because I think it, it, it could help make a difference. This is, this is more altruistic. The, honestly, I'll tell you when it's selfish and most of the stuff I do is self-orientated, but this one, th this one is altruistic, but this one is also uh, for the fact of, of reducing misinformation spread, which, which is a, a really a pet peeve annoyance of mine and, and finding the closest thing to the truth. So anyway, conclusion, the cost of waiting. It might feel scary to make a decision today, but you shouldn't think about it this way. So a one-day difference in social distancing measures can end exploding the number of deaths in your community by multiplying more cases and higher fatality rate. This is an exponential threat. Every day counts. When you're delaying by a single day a decision, you're not contributing to a few cases. There are probably hundreds or thousands of cases in your community area. This is the consequence of delaying your decision by a single day. And so we all have a role to play in this. And if you found this resourceful, please share it. Because I think we all need to hear this message. This is not me. I'm just the vessel. I'm just delivering it. I just happen to be a guy who's obsessed with learning and curiosity and, 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 and the health and the human body. I'm just the vessel. There's been all these amazing researchers, thinkers and influencers who have done the hard work. I've just aggregated it and distributed it. Now it is up to all of us, it is up to you to action it and do something with it and put pressure on the people around you to take action. We all have a role to play in this, at least not for now, for the future scenarios that will occur because this is just a dry run. This is just practice. Yeah, we're talking about practice. So... Put pressure on yourself to overcome your own biases, your own agendas. The world isn't what you want it to be. It's not. It is how it is, and it is not how you see it to be. Usually. The cost of waiting has significant consequences. Put pressure on yourself and people around you to do something about it. If not, we will continue to see an uptick and uprise in the severity and spreadability of this virus and more viruses in the future. It is not, it's never a matter of when. It's never a matter of, of if. It is a matter of when. I hope this has been resourceful. Please share it with somebody who you think needs to hear it. And in this case, it's everybody.